Well, thank you all for uh, coming out and, and joining us this evening. My name is Nikolai DePippa, and I'm the director of the public programs here at the Clinton School. And we want to first start off by thanking UAMS for uh, helping us do this program and, and partnering with us to, to bring these, uh, this lecture to the Clinton School. It's something that I've been trying to get for a while, so I'm glad that we were able to do it. Um, I'm not real big on long introductions, so we won't do those, but we'll just kind of start chatting here for a second. Um, but first, I want to start with who all has actually read The Immortal Life? Good. So we've got a good uh, background, so we don't need to go too much in the details, but we'll just kind of start chatting. So first, Sonny, I wanted you to kind of talk and just tell me a little bit about your mom. Testing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for inviting us out. We are honored to be here. Well, it's not too much I can tell about my mother. It's only thing... I can tell you is what the older generation told me about my mother. Like I was four years old when she died. And the uh, only thing I can remember is the funeral, and that's when I tell them that it was raining, everybody had black on. But from what the older generation tells me about her is that she was a giving person. She would invite everybody up from the country to come to her house in Turner Station, that, that's in Baltimore, and feed them and house them. You know, it's just, it's just wonderful. You get some stories from the older generations that they 60, 70, 80 years old, and they tell me in, like, in detail what happened like 60 and 70 years ago, and that's remarkable to me because I sit and think to myself, here, they, they telling you what happened 60 years ago. I can't remember what I did last week. <laughs> you, know, and I, you know, the stories was good for me because right now it's a learning process for me to find out about my mother and what she liked and what she did back then, those days. But all I can say is she was a giving person. Jerry, did they talk much about your grandmother when you, when you were growing up? Do you remember kind of when you started to hear stories and, and, and whatnot? When we were growing up, um, my family, no, they never really talked about my grandmother. I mean, because my father, he didn't know his mom, my, other, my aunt, my other uncles, too, um, my other uncle, but my oldest uncle, he just doesn't talk about his mother at all because I guess it's too painful and I guess he experienced what his mother was actually going through. So he doesn't really talk, he doesn't talk about his mom. As far as um, getting to know who she was, it was really from the book and from other people actually speaking about um, my grandmother that we actually started getting to know her. We knew that she did something special and it was the polio vaccine. We knew her cells went up into space, but we didn't know the full extent of her cells and what they contributed to the world. Rebecca, we kind of go into the first time you heard about Henry Lacks. I know you mentioned it in the beginning of the book, but I think it's kind of a poignant moment. Yeah, so I first learned about Henry Lacks when I was 16 in a basic biology class. And I was at a local community college because I had failed biology at the local high school. And I was making up the credits that I had missed. And my biology teacher said what most biology teachers say at some point, which is, there are these amazing cells. And they are still alive today, even though the woman they came from died in the 50s. He rattled off the list of some of the you know, important advances made using the cells, polio vaccine. First, he, um, they went up in the first space missions to see what would happen to human cells in zero gravity. They were the first cells ever cloned, the first genes ever mapped. They were used to create our most important cancer medications like vincristine and tamoxifen, which probably many people in this room have either taken or know somebody who has in vitro fertilization, the, the HPV vaccine, I mean, the list just goes on and on. And he said all this, and then he said they came from a woman named Henrietta Lacks. He wrote her name on the board, and then he said she was a black woman, and that was it. And he erased the board, and class was over, and I just sort of went up to him after class, and I was like, well, who was she, and what else do we know about her, and did she have any kids, and what do they think about these cells? And it really just grabbed me, and he just said, sorry, that's all we know. And he said, if you're curious, do a little research, see if you can find anything write up a little thing, I'll give you some extra credit. So this was in 1988, and I didn't immediately think, oh, I'm going to go devote like, you know, my entire adult life to researching this woman's life and writing this book, and um, I was planning to be a veterinarian, and so I didn't 
then, I mean, I think I went home, looked in the encyclopedias, didn't find anything, and sort of that was that. I didn't start getting interested in writing until about a decade later. Um, in I, the first writing class I ever took, which the reason I signed up for it was that our, my, the university where I went, for some reason counted creative writing as a foreign language. And <laughs> so I signed up for this class just because I was a pre-vet you know, pre student, so I was taking organic chemistry and biochemistry and all these really hard classes. And I felt like anything outside my major kind of felt like a waste of time. So I felt like, okay, writing will take less time away from my studies. And the first assignment we got in this class was to write a story about something someone forgot. And I wrote Henry the Lacks at the top of my page and wrote this story about the fact that the whole world seemed to have forgotten about her, but that I weirdly couldn't because I was sort of obsessed with her. And so it was actually quite a while after that even that I, that I really started thinking, I should find out who this woman was and actually see if I can track down her family. And you actually turned in that extra credit assignment, yes. right? Yeah, so when I finished the book, um, I sent a copy, of, yeah, like 25 years later, I sent a copy to this teacher of mine. He had retired long before and um, tracked him down, sent him a copy with a note that said, Dear Mr. Deffler, here's my extra credit paper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 25 years late, but you know, I have a really good excuse. It was hard to find anything. Um, and he was absolutely shocked. I mean, I tell this story often when I talk um, at schools because he actually, he had no memory of me whatsoever in that classroom. It was this huge auditorium style classroom with hundreds of students. He'd been saying the same thing every semester for decades. And, you know, I was just one of the kids out there who probably looked asleep. And, you know, his response was, you know, this is why we teach and this is why school is so amazing because you never know what one sentence someone says in a classroom is going to change somebody's life and what they're then going to go and do with it. Um, so yeah, he was, you know, and he's in the first pa paragraph of the book, Mr. Deffler up at the front of the, he was shocked, <laughs> you know, but what's interesting is since then he's had a lot of students come to him and say, guess what I did with a sentence you said. And so it's been a good thing for him. Well, I was a biology major in college and you actually go into Hendrix tomorrow and an immunology TA. And I never once thought of asking that question why. So I, I think there was, a, it, amazing that you were able to ask that, but then even more so that the family let you in. And so, Sonny, I wanted to kind of talk about all the previous reporters and people that had come before Rebecca, um, wanting information about the, your mom's cells and, and, and kind of what was the difference between Rebecca and the other reporters. Well, the only thing I can say is that I wasn't the one that decided who they want to talk to. My sister Deborah was the one that really decided who she wanted to talk to. Because like you said, there's other um, people that came out there and talked to Deborah and the family. And, you know, they just, that was just talk. And somehow Deborah and Rebecca uh, gets hooked up and it went from there. It was a goal that my sister Deborah wanted to find out about her mother and find or tell that the HeLa cells belong to Henry and Alex. So when her and Rebecca got together, they kind of made a bond, so that's how that came about. Yeah, but you, you also always tease me about the fact that I wouldn't go away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was, it was a, a love-hate relationship for everybody, I think, involved in it. I don't know that it was love-hate. It was a, it was, there was a lot of fear. I mean, I think the family rightly didn't trust anyone at that point who was coming along wanting anything having to do with these cells. And I think that was true for, you know, you and Lawrence and Deborah, everybody. Um, and yeah, it took about a year and a half to even just convince them to talk to me. Yeah, because uh, I was a street runner, and I said, this woman ain't going nowhere. She ain't going to give up. Every time I turn around, Dale coming with this woman to talk to me and stuff. I mean, she made about 20 appointments with me, and I never met, made any of them. And she had to find me, or I was having to run into her by mistake, so she caught me by mistake, and I had to talk to her then. I said, oh, Lord, here we go again. But Dale just trusted her, and she got the family to talk to us. That was, that was a good thing. That, is, that really was a good thing, you know? Because I look at it like this, you know, I, I got to speak in front of a beautiful audience like you all, you know? I get a little attention I like. I really like that, you know? <laughs> I, I, I have learned you don't have to be a singing star or movie star to get attention or have an audience. So that that's kind of that sit with me pretty good, you know? I like that. Yeah, well, and I think part of it, the, the winning the trust of the family, you know, when I came along initially, I had no idea what 
the family had been through. So for those of you who haven't read the book, you know, a big important part of the story is that these cells were taken without Henrietta's knowledge, um, without her family's knowledge. They were grown and became this incredibly important thing for science, commercialized, you know, bought and sold for money that was never, you know, shared with the family. There was there, that part of the story had been told a little bit here and there in the media, but what I didn't know, what no one really knew, was that her children were also used in research. So this is, to me, really, in some ways, the ethical heart of the story, in a lot of ways, that in the 70s, scientists came back to her family to do research on the children to learn more about the cells, and they did that without consent also. So it's, it's a story of multiple generations used in research. And, by the time I came along, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that not long before I showed up, their medical records were released to the press and published without their knowledge. And I mean, the number of things that had happened um, at that point were, were just sort of astonishing. And so I had this phone call with Deborah the first time I talked to her, where she said she was really excited about the idea of somebody writing a book about her mother. But then she was like, but how do I know you're not coming to steal my cells or something? And then she hung up on me. And I was like, what? Like, why, how, why would you think I was coming to steal your cells? And then she just, she was adamantly not going to talk to me for a long time. And so part of what I set out to do was to figure out why the family was afraid to talk to me. Like, why you would say that. And I realized in that moment something happened to these kids, her kids, that I, I needed to understand in order to really win their trust. And, and the other thing that I heard from Deborah over and over again was she wanted to know who her mother was and that the kids didn't really know anything about her. So to try and win their trust, I would go and find information about Henrietta and just give it to them, <laughs> leave it on their voicemails because they'd never answer the phone because they knew it was me. Deborah had caller ID. So I, you know, she, the voicemail would pick up and I would just tell her stories about her mom over the phone. And I think that, in the end, that's what, that's what I think helped her. Do you think that the, the John Hopkins article that you wrote in 2000, at, at the very end of it, you wrote, um, the story starts with Henrietta Lacks origin of the HeLa cells, they're not Helen Lane, Helen Larson, they were Henrietta Lacks, wife of David, mother of five. And that that was really trying to show Deborah that you, you wanted to do this with her? Yeah, I, mean, I would be interested to hear what you think about that. Sonny. Do you remember when, when the Hopkins article came out? And she kept showing it to everyone because everyone kept trying to... Uh, yes, because I uh, believe Deborah got every article that was written in reference to Henrietta Lacks and it kind of opened it up for all of us, because you know, my, my, in my mind, I say, uh, here comes this white lady want to talk to us about our mother, you know, and um, Deborah just kept on pushing us to talk to her, you know, because she was a person that would always, always want someone to open up about things. And like, I didn't know too much about my mother. My younger brother, who has an attitude problem, as the book says, still has attitude problem. <laughs> But, you know, it's hard to talk to him. And my older brother, he just didn't like to talk too much, you know. But Deborah got everybody to kind of pitch in a little bit. Yeah, and I do think the Hopkins article was a big moment. So the way that that article came about, I hadn't written anything about the family before. And that was, I was trying to get them to talk to me still. And Hopkins actually approached me and said, for their 50th anniversary, or 100th anniversary maybe. No, I can't remember. 50th, yeah, 50th, 50th, right. yeah. <laughs> Like, what year is it? Um, <laughs> They wanted to do this special issue of their magazine that was 50 of the most important advances done, made at Hopkins in 50 years. And they said, will you write a story about George Guy, the scientist who grew the HeLa cells? And I said, how about I write it about Henrietta instead? And so then I, that became part of the conversation with them. And I was like, so I'm going to you know, do this for Hopkins. And they were like, You're, Hopkins is never going to print an article about, the fa about this stuff, like that they took the cells without asking, that we're mad. And I was like, just try me. <laughs> And so I do think that the fact that that story came out under the Hopkins sort of banner, you know, it was the first time that Hopkins had publicly acknowledged in any way what had happened to the family. So I think that that probably did help somewhat too. And, and the fact that this lady wouldn't give up. She wouldn't go problem. away. She wouldn't right. go away. This, this, this problem right here ain't going nowhere. So we might as well talk to her and get it over because she act like she ain't going nowhere. You know, so she'd come to dinner, lunch, cookouts, eat crabs with us and everything. I, I'd come over and eat some crabs. I said, look at this. Only white lady there, and she's sitting up there waiting, asking questions, still at the place. I said, oh, Lord, we got to go through this again. Show up on the tobacco fields, and we like, send pictures of me down there. I'm like, hey, me and Cousin Cliff are picking tobacco. And they're like, what are you doing? Yeah. Jerry, were you around at all? Do you remember, was Rebecca, do you remember Rebecca growing up? Actually, I do not remember Rebecca. Um, 
Baptism. Because she actually, I know, the baptism, I cannot remember I that. I was the and photographer she, at her children, her, child, her daughter's baptism. I took all the pictures. Pictures, <laughs> right, and I cannot remember that for the world, no. I, I in some ways, I think that's good. It's like my job to be a I mean, did, did people a not, like, in the, in the Lax family, just always talk about my the reporter? I mean, they've always referred to you as, as her reporter. reporter. And so that kind of was how, I, I, if you spent 11 years with my family, you would be a sister. So I, I don't know how that you know, when my mom is here and she didn't have us, she had four boys, so she would have appreciated that. Um, so I just wanted to know about the dynamic between the family and, and Rebecca throughout the time that she was working on this. Oh, she came a part of the family. Deborah made sure that, and you know, the younger generation, my daughter, didn't remember her at the Christian because you know how the younger generation, do, you know, they, they remember a person one time and the next day they don't know who you are. But, <laughs> You know, that's the younger generation. Now, with something important, if she was sung an important record, she would remember real way back then, you know, but uh, the younger generation back then didn't pay attention to like, that type of situation. But my sister made sure that everybody knew who Rebecca was, and she made her a part of the family, point blank. I'm curious, when do you remember me? Like, when's the, when, do you, when did I show up in your memory? Do you even know? When the book came out, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd been at her house, so we may have to talk about your memory a little bit. But, yeah. um, but no, I used to, I, part of it was, you know, my job sort of as a writer is to be invisible in a sense. So I was always there, and I always had my tape recorder on and my notebook out and like, you know, taking pictures and doing things. But in a sense, to do the kind of reporting I do, you kind of need to be, you know, they talk about fly on the wall reporting. And so, you know, my job is to be very present, but not intrusive at all. So to me, it's actually kind of nice to hear that I, because in my mind, I feel like they must feel like this weird person just followed us around for a decade. And so. Um, and, and Sunny, Rebecca mentioned this about when they started to take the family's blood in the 70s. And so I kind of wanted to discuss with you about that, kind of your feelings when that was happening and when you started to find out more information on what they actually were doing. Well, when they took Let's say when they came and took our blood, when they wanted the family to give blood and tissues, we didn't know what they was doing. They told us that um, they was doing something that would help our next generation, my kids. So, you know, of course I wanted to do something to uh, find out, but they never came back and told us what they was doing. They never told us at all. We kind of figured out years later, you know, because at, at that time we didn't care, but years later we, they were trying to find out if any of the Lacks children had the heel cells or the same cell line as Henrietta Lacks, but no one had it, no one in the family at all. But it was okay. And then you found out that they had been selling them. Yes. And that yes. was kind of changed the story, especially in, in your eyes, kind of? Yeah, it, it changed the story in a sense of saying for the younger generation. You know, they figure here they out there making millions of bees and dollars, and here we don't have anything. We don't even have health care, you know, but. It changed some of the ideas in some of the younger generation. To me, you know, conversation was from the healer cells, what they have did for everybody, you know. That's why I look at it helped everybody, you know. So I'm grateful for that. Now, don't get me wrong now. I like to have a pocket full of money now. There ain't no problem with that. You ain't going to turn it away. Yeah, no, that's definitely not going to turn it away. But, uh, you know, What's going to be is going to be as well. That's, that's how I look at it. Rebecca, you went to great lengths to try to show the scientist side of the story as well as the family side. And I, especially in the 50s, you were trying, I, I think I took, that you were trying to show there were not ill intentions. And it really was just kind of the times. The times, and yes, there's some things that they did procedurally wrong. Um, do you feel that in the 70s it was like that as, as well? Or was that kind of skirting some ethical lines of what they should and shouldn't have told the family. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, in the 50s, like you said, I mean, what taking cells without people's knowledge was absolutely standard. I mean, in some ways it still is today. Um, they had no idea what they were doing. We didn't even know what DNA was. They didn't know those cells would be worth money someday. They didn't know they'd be able to look in those cells and learn, you know, things about them and their kids and grandkids. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this was science that was moving ahead of the sort of ethical questions that people even knew to ask about them. And they really were, you know, very well-intentioned. And, um, you know, George Guy, 
I think one of the early, in the early days, the test of ethics you really used to be, are you willing to do it to yourself and your family as a scientist? And if you aren't, there's probably some problem with what you're doing. Um, you know, and George Guy and his wife were, you know, they're growing each other's cells, they're injecting anything at each other with weird things. I mean, they were just, and they were using all their personal money, they were broke, and they invested everything they had in trying to grow these cells. And so I felt like it was very important to tell that side of the story. But yeah, in the 70s, it was a pretty, it was a slightly different situation. We definitely had informed consent for the kind of research that was being done. There were, it, it really was a completely different era. And I've heard from a lot of um, scientists who were colleagues, you know, of the, the researchers who came back to the family. And just across the board, since the book came out, they've all basically been like, yeah, we knew better than that then. That shouldn't have happened like that. And, um, and I actually think, you know, there's, there's also, of course, a lot of questions about race that come into play in the book, race and class. And, um, you know, when Henrietta went to the hospital, she ended up at Hopkins in this ward where she was treated because she was black. She couldn't go anywhere else because of segregation. And people often ask me, you know, were the cells taken because she was a black woman? I mean, is this, you know, another example of a Tuskegee? And, and it wasn't. They were taking cells from anyone they could get their hands on, really. Hers just happened to grow. And in the 70s, I actually think that's probably the point where race played the biggest role, um, because the scientists who went back to the kids to do research, they grew up during the era of segregation. And they, you know, I had a, quite a bit of contact with them, and it became pretty clear to me through the course of doing the research that, you know, had I been a black reporter, they wouldn't have been talking to me in the same way that I, that, that I, they were talking to me as a white reporter. And it sort of became clear to me through talking to them that probably part of it was that if, if, if the Lacks family had been a white family, they probably would have gotten a much clearer explanation of what was going on and there would have been consent. But for some reason, that wasn't involved for them um, in the 70s. So it is a much more complicated part of the story. And if they would have probably just explained it a little bit better, it, it, it's not as if what they were doing was, you know, commercialization or anything. It really was trying to right. a, increase the cell line because of this Gila bomb that right. you talk about. Yeah, no, there was no malicious intent at all at that point. I um, also wanted, Jerry, you tell me a little bit what was the biggest change in your life since this book came out. The biggest change, I guess, um, traveling. Doing a lot of traveling, speaking to people, um, uh, I guess going around and people will see, sometimes we'll wear our um, Hen Henrietta Lacks t-shirt and people are like, oh, okay, I've read that book. And they'll go rambling on about the book and how the family was mistreated and so forth, so forth. And I'll say, okay, I'm the granddaughter. And they be like, oh my gosh, you are. Let me take a picture. And so it has been a, a great experience. And it's a great experience just to actually have people email us saying, okay, I'm so grateful and thankful for your grandmother, for all the things that she has done for me, my mother, my family. Um, so it, it's been a wonderful experience. I just think it's just so amazing how my grandmother is giving and she's still giving you know, through her death. So uh, it's been wonderful. The stories that, I mean, Sonny, you have a lot of these stories too, of oh, yeah, people definitely. coming to the family <laughs> and saying, I have to tell you the way that your mother's cells changed my life, you know, and it's just, I mean, it really is sort of endless, right? It is, it is, just like Dad, tell them about the, um, when you went to McDonald's, remember? It, 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 it <laughs> felt real good, you know, to get the attention, you know. You know, you don't have to, you don't get too many opportunities to get attention. And, you know, I went to uh, McDonald's to give me a, a, a double hamburger and I ordered french fries. And this little young girl had a, a t-shirt on with the Henrietta Lacks and she was just telling some of her workers that she read the book and she loved the book. And then when I stepped up to the counter and told her to give me my um, food, you know, and she said, I said, you know, that you, did you get a chance to read the book? She said, yes. And when I told her that I was the son, but she just started yelling. I thought I was, I thought I was Justin Bieber or somebody, you know, or, or, or Denzel or something. I looked around and everybody said, I said, hey, I was, I was surprised, but you know, it made me feel good. You know, his young girl, she was no more about 17, 18 years old. You know, it just, it just, you know, it's just attention sometimes, you know, it just it makes you feel good. Yeah, and I mean, for me, so part of what the story is about is the importance of science literacy and people being able to engage with science and understand science. So moments like that, 
I mean, it's fun, and it's this kid, you know, young person really, like, I can't even I think of a time in history when a young person has walked up to someone and, and freaked out, like Justin Bieber style, about a science-related issue. Like, it's pretty amazing to me to watch that, to watch the, the younger generation, both sort of out in the public, but also in the Lax family. I mean, you know, the younger generation of Laxists, just their reaction when they heard this story was like, Henrietta is a rock star. Do you want to talk, yes. talk about that? Do you want to talk about that? And like the microscope day? And Oh, what microscope? What, um, yeah, like, at John Hopkins? Mm -hmm. when we, oh, okay, yeah, John Hopkins, they um, did a microscope day, and all the family, the Lex family and friends, actually went down to John Hopkins to, to, for the first time to actually view the HeLa cells, and it was just so amazing. I mean, it was like a group of us, I guess like 15, 15 of us that actually went to actually see the cells, and they had different microscopes that you could actually look through. I don't know what kind of lens. I'm not really in biology. Mm -hmm. But there's different lenses that they use to actually zoom in to see the cells, and it was it was pretty amazing. So we have been experiencing a lot of things. Just like my father, he went across, he received um, an honorary degree from Morgan State University, and on behalf of his mom, which was great. Then Morehouse School of Medicine, they actually do an event every year, and they've been doing this for the last 17 years, way before the book even came out. They was actually knew about Henrietta Lacks and was trying to get the world to, you know get a, a have knowledge of Henrietta Lacks. They have the um, Turner Station where Henrietta grew up. They have a, a yearly event in Turner Station. So a lot of things have, is I guess, prospering off of her. She's being honored in a lot of ways, which we are really grateful and proud. I mean, the world is getting to know who Henrietta Lacks is, who the heel of cell belongs to. Yeah. Yeah. Several scholarships, yes. right? Yeah. And like a high school named after her. Yeah. Everything, you know, and then you got the, uh, Henry Lux Foundation that Rebecca is in charge of mm -hmm. and sponsored. And like my daughter said, uh, Microscope Day, we got a chance to see ourselves. I, I got a chance to see ourselves. And as I said before, I'm still learning about my mother. And through her cells, I learned something from her. You know, here I'm looking through a microscope and it's showing us how her cells divide and they had other cell lying in there. And, her cells was taking over this other cell, and I was saying to myself, this lady, my mother, had an attitude problem even after death, so you know what kind of woman she was when she was living. She didn't want nobody in her space like she did. Now, imagine how she was when she was living, but, you know, it was just wonderful to see something like that. You know, and then the doctor said, well, now they're the Henrietta Lacks cells now, the heal cells. That was wonderful. Well, right before we go to questions from the audience, uh, Rebecca, I want to to talk a little bit about the form and how you came to the being in, in the book. I know that it's, it's a topic of discussion that comes to you a lot, but specifically how in the end of the book, or it, this version of how you, how you publish it, the soul cleansing um, that Deborah has with Gary. And it, isn't that kind of one of the main reasons why you decided that this story of y'all doing this research really needs to be a part of it? Yeah, I was definitely the last person on board with the idea of me being in the book. Um, you know, my philosophy with it from the very beginning was this is their story, this is not my story. And I teach writing and I all harp on my students all the time, like stop inserting yourself into other people's stories. It's something writers do all the time, drives me nuts. And so I would go out and I was doing all this research, you know, Deborah and I were traveling around and things started happening that were really just sort of astonishing. And, you know, and some of it was just the Deborah's and the family's resistance. And I had um, a couple really wise, sort of older um, writers who were uh, kind of mentors to me. And one of them just kept saying over and over, their resistance to you is part of the story. Figure out why they're so resistant to you and you will find the real story. And and I was like, okay, but it does, that part doesn't have to be in there. And you know, and then we, I would come home from these trips and tell these stories of un, sort of unbelievable things that were happening to us as, on our travels, and you know, my editor and my friends would all say, you gotta put that in the book. And I'm, no, no, it's their story, not my story. And even Deborah started to harp on me. She would always say, like, don't you make me be in that book by myself. Like, you're part of this story, too. And it took me a while, but at a certain point, and it really was during this sort of faith healing scene, I mean, it was, I mean, for those who haven't read the book, it's sort of the build up to it is, it's sort of the, one of the climactic points of the book, but we've been traveling and along the way have uncovered some information about her sister that was just really traumatic and shocking and neither one of us could have possibly seen it coming. She was institutionalized at 15, a place called the Home for Crazy Negroes. And what happened to her there was just, uh, just 
unthinkable. And we, part of the process of doing the research on the book, Deborah knew something happened to her sister. She wanted to find out what it was. So we went there and, you know, these pictures are appearing in front of us and information that was really traumatizing for her that she, it was just dangerous for her to see at that point. And I couldn't have stopped her if I'd tried. I mean, it's you, <laughs> you know, but at that point, she just started to kind of spiral. She really had a, phys a physical reaction to the stress of a lot of what she was learning. And, and she ended up really essentially having a stroke um, pretty soon after. Um, it wasn't just because of that, it was a lot of different things. But during the process of all this, there was this, a faith healing, essentially. We were in this town where her mother was raised, and uh, one of their cousins, who's uh, one of these guys who sort of start channeling the Lord in the middle of a conversation and is just, you know, singing and praying, he essentially laid hands on Deborah and started saying, you know, Lord, you've got to take the burden of the cells from this woman. And, and give them to you. And then, yeah, very surprisingly to me, he went, you've got to give them to her. And that was really the moment that I knew I had no choice but to be in the book. And, um, <laughs> and Deborah refers to, referred to that as the moment Henrietta hit me over the head with a frying pan because I was being, I was being argumentative about being in the book. Um, but really what that, more than that moment, it was really that whole trip where I realized that Deborah was in danger while we were on our trip. And I just started questioning my role as a journalist and what, what does it mean to tell someone's story? What kind of dangers, you know, does that come with? And how do you deal with that ethically? And, and then, you know, it, it became clear to me that it would have been dishonest to leave myself out. You know, I tell the story of all the journalists who came before me and the, the things that happened to the family as a result. And if and I was there longer than anybody else. So, you know, to have a book where it's like all these other journalists came along and did things and then <laughs> nothing about me, it, it just wouldn't have been an honest way to tell the story, I think. She just made the story interesting, that's all. You had to put some, you had to put some <laughs> juicy stuff in there, too, man. Because the Vox family by itself was just not interesting enough. No, that, no, right? no, no, I know, yeah. I know. You guys you know, don't do anything. You know, and... even, even, I mean, I'm going to say everybody, but even I like to hear a little badness sometimes, how you say it, put a little dirt in it sometimes, you know. <laughs> but it's good to go. Well, we have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Um, and any questions from anybody? I've got tons more, but I wanted to hear what you guys had to say. Ashley? being here, all of you. I'm a student here at the Clinton School and I'm a student at the UAMS College of Public Health, so I got to hear you twice today, so it's really, really great that you're here. My question is, in your book, you, sp you spoke a lot about the, the publications that came out before, um, kind of in the scientific medical field. So my question is how the medical field reacted when your book came out, because it did. It told, it told that whole story that wasn't told yet. And if, did Hopkins have a response? Um, what kind of feedback you got and who started contacting you after its publication? Yeah, the, the response from the medical and just scientific world has been really amazing. I think a lot of people assume that scientists wouldn't want this story out there, that they feel like it sort of tarnishes their the scientific reputation or something, and that hasn't been the case at all. Um, scientists, while I was working on it, were incredibly forthcoming, and sometimes that word would start getting out that I was working on the book, and you know, the generation of scientists I was writing about were in their 80s and 90s, and they were dying, and their field hadn't really been documented that much, and so they were contacting me and sending me stories and sending me documents that they were finding in their file cabinets, and so the openness of scientists all along the way has been pretty amazing. And then when the story came out, it was actually the day the book came out, I got my first the first contact I got from a, doc, a scientist was a researcher from Hopkins who I was on NPR on uh, Terry Gross and she sent me this email and she said and it was just essentially saying I'm freaking out right now because I was standing in my lab immortalizing leftover tissues from circumcisions which I do all day long basically and I heard you on the radio and I just broke down and I was like these people don't know I'm doing this and none of these kids who then grow, go, you know, I've been doing this for decades and none of the people whose cells I've grown know that they've done it and what does this mean and who are they and where are they, you know, and she just immediately kind of spiraled into this and I hear that all the time. Um, and so one of the, I get questions from scientists a lot, I'm working on this cell line, can you tell me who it came from, did they get permission, like what's their story? So I think it, it really you know, scientists just never stop to ask where these cells came from and if anyone gave permission, and I think it's common with a lot of cells. Um, so that's something that I think the book did was to spark this 
curiosity and conversation among scientists. As far as Hopkins, I mean, we can all talk about a bit about the Hopkins reaction. The initially, when the book came out, Hopkins put out a press release about a week later that said, "Yes, we took the cells without asking. That was standard procedure at the time, which is true." And they said, "You know, and we didn't make." You know, we gave them all away for free. We didn't make any money off of them, which is also true. Um, but then they didn't say anything about the rest of the story, the kids being used in research, the medical records being released. And I think they just really didn't know yet. Um, they hadn't read the book. And I think no one at Hopkins really understood the full story. And so I showed up about a week later to do a talk for a group of high school, or sorry, a group of writing students. And I showed up, there's this long line of people waiting to talk to me. Like, hello, I'm the head of the Hopkins IRB. Hello, I'm the head of, you know, diversification and outreach in science. And basically everyone who dealt with the real world implications of the story. And they all just said, we're not okay with that response. And so then what happened was this sort of uprising within Hopkins where the faculty members from all different parts of the school said, we're going to do things you know, to make this right. And so then they would like, you know, for a while there's like a group of them who's like, we're going to name a building after her. We're going to, then somebody else is like, I'm going to make it so all the freshmen have to read it. And that happened. The building didn't happen. <laughs> Scholarship happened. And then, you know, and then they started this microscope day. They started really inviting the family in. I don't know if you guys want to talk about that experience. Um, but they really did start reaching out to the family. Yes, they, they started reaching out to the family. You know, I mean, they start doing things. They give it, every year they give it a little dinner engagement and uh, have a speakers there and have us there. It's, it's pretty nice, you know, they, they kind of reaching out for us a little bit, you know. They doing everything they can. They, they don't want to openly apologize to us because they say it would open too many doors for other people that have done things with, with John Hopkins Hospital. Everything looked like it comes to be a legal thing when, with John Hopkins for us doing anything for the Lax family, you know. But they're trying to do a little something, so I'm not complaining. Like I said, the younger generation is the only one that complain, you know. They have, their, they have their say about certain things, you know. They look at it, the pharmaceuticals and the cosmetic companies that's making money off ourselves, and they holler about, you know, what can be done. And we talk to lawyers, statute of limitations is gone, plus they saying her sales now is like public domain. Every, anybody can do anything what they want to do with herself, and they can make a profit off it without, you know, letting the Lax family know of it. So, you know, it's getting to the legal part of it. So what they're doing now is, is great for, from my point of view. Uh, the younger generation, my daughter's generation, and my nephews and nieces, they think other ways. So I, I'm just going along with what they think and listen to them. Jerry's over here going, uh -uh. what other ways? No, I, I agree with my dad as far as, um, you know, John Hopkins kind of stepping up to the plate. I mean, this is, we have to realize that it's what's happened 50, 50 years ago. So it's a new generation. And I think they're trying to do everything within their means to apologize to the family in a not direct way, but in a, indirectly apologize. Like my father said, they doing the they did microscope. They do the Henrietta Lacks Healer um, Symposium every year. They did a, um, they doing a scholarship, giving a student a scholarship from Dunbar High School that's in Baltimore, Maryland, in honor of Henrietta Lacks's name. They're doing the um, like a community um, organization. They give them um, funds in honor of Henrietta Lacks's um, name. Um, so I, I think John Hopkins is doing whatever, I mean, doing what they can. Yeah, they and I, I think they can do a little more, and time will show. I know they will. I know they will step up to the plate. They're doing everything but kicking that money out. That's what they're doing. <laughs> they ain't kicking that money out to no one, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that happened is, so all these people within Hopkins started saying, we want to do different things. And then there's, you know, the team of lawyers at Hopkins who's sort of overseeing it all. And there were certain rules, basically, like, you can do whatever you want to, you know, reach out to the family. You cannot use the words, I'm sorry, or apology, because it opens the doors for a legal case, not just from other people, but from the Lax family, um, because it seems to be an admission of guilt. And you can't write them, you can't hand them any money. Um, and I think the one other thing that Hopkins has been doing, which is interesting, is, you know, the family qualifies, particularly Henry his kids, they qualify for quite a bit of free care, um, but no one has ever been able, they've not, they haven't really been able to navigate that system. I mean, it's, it's a really difficult system. So one group of people within Hopkins 
sort of has become their devoted team. So like if Sonny has to go to the doctor, he can call them and they'll say, okay, here's the form you gotta fill out. They'll take it to his house if he needs it. They'll bring him to the doctor and they'll help find the right doctor. And so they sort of have these chaperones in a sense where, or like guides through the system that if they want them, they can get that help. They, so they're, and they're able to get, you know, quite a bit of care that way, but there's still no, nothing that someone else in their situation couldn't get as well. They just get the help to get it. So it's like, it's a very fine line. Free health care. I think everybody should have free health care. Ain't no question about that. You know, even though, even though that's on the table nowadays, I always say that, you know, everyone should have health care. You know, we shouldn't have to worry about going to the doctor or worrying about buying medicine and all of, all of the above, you know, because one of my things is, you know, when I go to a doctor and the doctor tell me, well, he had, I have this name brand medicine for four hundred dollars for you to take that will help your condition. But here I'm had since you can't afford to give this fifty dollar medicine. So my question is always how come the four hundred dollar medicine will definitely help my condition, but they want to give me the fifty dollar medicine. What's the difference, you know? But they always tell me that it's where they get it from and it's the name brand. I said, Well you know, I know I can't afford that four hundred dollar give me that four hundred I wanna make sure I stay for a little while. Don't give me that fifty dollar one. That ain't gonna do me that much good. But I always ask that question, but you know, it's getting there. Healthcare is one of the issues that's in the United States today, and that's something that's going to be a good thing for everyone. So I've only read a portion of the book so far. Shame on you. I know, but I will finish it before I go to sleep tonight. But the scientist in me wonders why those cells grew. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, we don't entirely know. So there are certain things we definitely know. One is that her, her cancer was caused by HPV, the virus that causes cervical cancer, sexually transmitted. So we know that that interacts with cells and makes them become cancerous. She also had um, syphilis, which can weaken your immune system and cause cancer cells to grow more rapidly. But a lot of people, especially in the 50s, had HPV and syphilis, and their cells didn't just grow. So there's something else that happened and really that's the big question mark. And it's funny because no one has really looked and I think, I mean now they are. So I get this question a lot. A lot of scientists are like, why don't we know this? We should, we should know this. Um, and I think it's because when the cells first grew, they were so desperate to have cells to use for all these other reasons. They didn't stop and say, well, let's first examine why they're growing. You know, they just took off with them. And then the later generations of scientists came along and the cells were just everywhere, you know, there's the test tubes, there's the lab mice and the fruit flies and the HeLa cells and the, you know, and no one stopped to wonder where they came from, who they came from, why they were growing. So it's really only been recently that people have started asking that question. Hello, my name is Nicole Maddox. I'm a student here at the Clinton School. First off, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for writing the story. I am so proud to know that she will not be forgotten. When I taught ninth grade biology, I actually used the story to introduce cellular division, and Sonny talked about that a little bit. And I wanted to know if you have been approached by textbook companies to include this story, um, particularly in high school uh, textbooks. Yeah, you mean just the story of the, sort of Henrietta being behind the HeLa cells? Yeah, I mean, it's happening widely. It's interesting. You know, science is all about revising the fact, you know, revising your idea of what's going on based on the facts you find, right? So one of the scientific reactions to the story has been like, oh, our textbooks are wrong. You know, they all say they came from this woman named Helen Lane. And, you know, and so, yeah, so a lot of them are actually being revised in their next editions to, so the name is right, and a lot of them use her picture. And um, so, yeah, and we don't even hear about that because, I mean, the ones that use her photograph, I think they usually have to ask, but for just changing the text, all I know is that I hear that it's happening a lot, um, and I believe that. Like, will you kind of finish up on the tissue culture line current state and how most people have some part of their body that's somewhere you mentioned a little bit about um, the person that called you, but how we don't know, most of us didn't know that. And, and I know you started the conversation, but how prevalent that is. Hi, it's, it's it, everybody, every, you know, it's very prevalent. Um, you know, the last statistics, the, the last actual numbers we have are from um, 2009. Is that right? No, sorry, 1999? Now I'm forgetting the, the date, but quite a while ago. Um, and that was, you know, basically the majority of Americans at this point have tissues on file somewhere, many of them being used in research. And, you know, everybody who was born in the U.S. after 
um, the sort of late 60s, it, when it became federal law that you have to test newborns for genetic diseases. So we all get these blood samples taken, and those little blood samples go onto little cards that get stored and often get used in research. People don't know that. And so basically the way the law stands now is that as long as the samples were taken for reasons other than research, so biopsy, you know, some routine thing, um, and your identity is removed, those can be used in research without explicit consent. And that's actually changing. There's now just recently a new, and I think in large part in response to this story and the, the sort of public reaction that has happened because of the story, um, they've, there's revising the law that hasn't been changed since the 70s that's a, they're trying to essentially make it so all tissue research does require consent. Um, but you know, there are a lot of questions. How do you do that? How do you get consent for something when you don't know what it's going to lead to in the future? I mean, if they had asked Henrietta, can we take you know, these samples and grow them, we, they couldn't have said, they may be worth money someday, we may be able to learn things about your kids, and so there's a lot of discussion about how do you get that consent, how do you do it in a way that doesn't interfere with science, I mean, there's a lot of uh, moving parts to that. I think that was the interesting part, is that the reasoning behind that was to interfere of science research, yet now it's interfering in some research because there's patents on genes and then people can sit squat on something and, and you can't do research because of that. And you. He talked a little bit about this, the actual value that was made from some of these cells, yet I can't afford you know, health care. So how is that public domain? Yeah, I think that one of the things that I, I hear from the public a lot about this issue, one of the other things that has happened since the book came out, you know, people would always say, are there more healers out there? Are there other people who sell? And essentially the answer is sort of yes, like millions of them. We don't know who they are. And their stories aren't like Henrietta's story in that her children were used in research and everything. And actually, since the book has come out, one of the things that's been shocking to me is the number of people who've contacted me and said, the same thing happened to me. And really the way it, and I'm actually writing a little bit of a follow-up about this now, that it, the way it looks really is that historically, once a cell line became very important, scientists sort of couldn't resist going and finding the people and doing more research. And sometimes that was on their children, sometimes it was just on the person themselves. So there are actually many people out there who sometimes a few years later, sometimes a decade later, got a phone call saying, um, so we've got these cells. And across the board, their responses are that, you know, initially they're shocked. It's a very similar sort of emotional reaction. Um, but they're all happy that the cells have been used in research and that they've done important things and where people get upset is when money is involved. And the issues that come up are, as Sunny said, healthcare access, you know, people, that's the big question. It's like, okay, so if we're all providing the tissues that are being used for this research and we're all paying for it with tax dollars, how is it that we can't all get the result? Um, so that's, I think, really in some ways at the heart of the money questions that get asked. Um, and then the other big thing is, is that I hear from each of these people whose cells have been used in different ways is that the only times that they talk to lawyers is when there was someone restricting access to the cells. Well, thank you so much for being so obsessed with <laughs> the story that you provided for us. Thank all of you for coming out, Sunny and, and Jerry, thank you as well. Um, we are going to do a, a little book signing over here, and so I'm going to have them kind of get it in place. and. Anyone that wants a book signed to get in line on by the stairs, and we'll kind of make a little counterclockwise out. So thanks again, UAMS. Thanks, uh, all of you as well. Thank you very much.